to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We are coming to you from Sacramento, California. We are joined by Betty Yee. She is a member of the Board of Equalization. She is a candidate for controller of this great state. And I must say, what a victory, one could argue. Recently, the California Democrats had their convention, and the party can endorse a candidate for statewide yes, office. Yes, yes. 60% plus one. Yes. You're running against the speaker, John Perez. And no one got the endorsement. You both got just under 50%. That's right. That's wow. Right. You know, I think uh, I was very heartened by the uh, response by the delegates, and I think um, certainly it was uh, for us and for our campaign, it was really a recognition that uh, um, you know, we have two two good Democrats sure. running for the office, but uh, also uh, I was very pleased with just the support that I had for the experience that I bring to the office. And what's so, so interesting about the endorsement or lack thereof is that likely you will run for this office against a Democrat twice. We now have what's called an open primary. Absolutely. So it's yes. not the top Democratic vote getter versus the top Republican vote getter. I don't know that there is a viable Republican candidate in the race. I shouldn't say that, but 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 polls suggest that you two will likely advance to the general. Yes, this is the first uh, statewide election cycle where we are employing the uh, top two in the primary, right. and so uh, that easily can be a Democrat against Democrat in some so of these races. In how does that work for you? How do you play that? You know, I play uh, really just to my strengths in terms of the experience I bring to the job, and frankly, this uh, office of controller um, isn't partisan when you think about the work of the it's office. Not. And so I would hope that Californians would agree that uh, we need uh, just strong, experienced leadership in the office, and that's what I uh, hope to be. be so currently to. you're at the Board of Equalization. Yes. You're looking to be controller. Both offices uh, deal at some level with taxes. Yes, they do. And taxation. And we're in the midst of tax season as we speak we now. Are, yes. And so I want to talk to you uh, and offer some tips for folks yes. that are looking to file their taxes either on April 15th or they may seek an extension. Sure. Before we talk about April 15th, I think there's a misnomer out there. When you file for an extension yes. on April 15th, what does that denote? So uh, anyone who wants to extend their uh, filing uh, beyond April 15th must file an extension by April 15th, but if you owe taxes, you still have to pay by April 15th. That, and that is the key. That's right, and most taxpayers don't know that, or the, uh, most members of the public don't know that. So you have an extension essentially to file the return, but not to pay the tax. When I started to seek extensions yes. because my taxes for whatever reason got more complicated, I was shocked. And by the way, I'm a licensed attorney. You would have thought that <laughs> right. I would have known that an extension is just an extension to file, That's not an right. extension to pay. That's right. So it's very important to know and, that. And as a matter of policy, it makes sense. The, the taxing agency still needs its revenue. Absolutely. But the state does. Uh -huh. Be that as it may. And so when you do file that extension, is it literally just a single page where you estimate how much you believe you will owe? It, de it depends on the taxpayer. So, I see. Uh, because you want to calculate pretty close to what you uh, owe, and you can make an estimate of that. Um, it could be based on um, your prior year's return sure. and, and uh, estimating forward on that. But uh, clearly, wanting to take care of that tax liability so the interest and penalties don't start to And out. that's the next question. Yes. Will interest and penalties yes. attach if you calculate it wrong, but properly filed for an extension. Yes, yes. And so we want to be sure you're paying the right amount of tax. Now, obviously, if you overestimate, that's a good thing. But right. If you underestimate, you're going to be probably in a penalty situation. Will you be treated the same as if you never even sought the extension? Uh, I think, well, uh, pretty much, because that's just on the tax. So the extension is purely for the filing of the return. So you will not be penalized for filing a late return because you filed the extension, because okay. there are penalties associated with ah, that. I see. But the penalty will be applied on the amount of the wrong amount of tax paid. Okay, for our viewers on HLN, I want to thank you so much for joining us. For our other viewers, we're going to be right back speaking with Betty Yee about other programs offered by the state to assist those that may be filing their taxes in the coming months. I'm Brad Palmer, so we'll be right back. So let's speak about some other elements yes. of tax policy yes. because it can be a bit complicated, but there's some good news. There is a program known as VITA. Yes. Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. Yes. Talk to us about the VITA program. Vi the VITA program is this wonderful program of the Internal Revenue Service and uh, there are about 300 what we call VITA locations throughout California and they're specific 
goal is to offer free tax filing assistance for those who uh, make uh, who earn incomes of uh, under fifty-two thousand dollars a year, which is a decent living. Absolutely, I mean, decent. absolutely. So it's free tax filing assistance. Uh, the Vita Centers are also a great place to learn about other public benefits. Um, we know that uh, there is information about Cover California in terms ah. of uh, getting people enrolled in uh, health insurance. Sure. So it's a great, great uh, one-stop shop for a lot of these. Uh, uh, types of programs. And how can we find out where VITA programs are? Sure, a couple of different ways. So um, you can go on the, uh, <clears throat> you can call a toll free number. Sure, we'll uh, put that on we'll the screen. Put that on the screen. Right. Uh, there also is a VITA locator tool on the IRS website. Put so that you can type on the in screen. your zip code and Perfect. it will show you where your locations are. We've talked about this before, we talk about it every year, but I think it's important that we really bring it home. Yes. Because it is amazing how many people leave what I'm about to describe on the table. Yes. It's known as the earned income tax credit. Yes. If you can, be as specific as possible about what it is and why so many people leave it on the table. Yes. So the earned income tax credit, uh, I would characterize as being probably the largest anti-poverty program that's been enacted by right. the federal government. And what it is, it's a credit to help working families. And it doesn't matter whether you owe tax, it doesn't matter whether you have to file a return, but if you meet the income requirements, and for an eligible individual uh, who has worked, uh, they need to have made less than $51,567. Again, a very that's high a threshold. decent absolutely, living. That's absolutely, absolutely. That's a decent living. But uh, the, the credit can be uh, all the way up to uh, over $6,000. But this is money that is left on the table. And the idea here is that these are working families, raising children, maybe not making enough through their earnings, but certainly can apply for this refundable credit. And what does uh, it mean? Explain what a credit means. So a credit means that uh, it is, um, uh, it, it's, it's money that frankly you can, because this is a refundable one, right. it's, uh, you actually get paid a check. So, it, so regardless it, of right. what you owe uh, with respect to your other uh, tax liability from work and wages, this earned income tax credit is a credit in and of itself that you qualify for based on what you earn. And I think that's the reason why there is such a push yes. by elected officials up and down Absolutely. the spectrum. Because in the final analysis, when that check comes, what happens to that check? Well, it goes right back into the economy, it right? So in. these are families that are probably, although we are encouraging families, if you can save any of that, True. please save. But uh, it could make the difference in terms of uh, being able to pay utility bill or the rent or uh, any other um, uh, household uh, um, Costs. And when we think about the state of California, almost 40 million people, mm -hmm. close to 10% of Californians are likely eligible yes. for the earned income tax That's right. credit. That's right. I mean, it could be anyone watching today. They could be. So what should they do? What should people do to figure out? I mean, you've said it if you earn under 51000 right. but what do you do? Well, uh, coincidentally, the um, income thresholds for the earned income tax credit are pretty similar to uh, what the uh, VITA locations, sure. uh, uh, the families that the VITA locations serve. So I would recommend that taxpayers find their VITA location close by. This is a main, uh, main function of these VITA locations is the earned income uh, tax I credit see. eligibility. Sure. So we encourage uh, anyone who thinks they may be eligible to please go to a VITA center close to them. We have about um, 800,000 Californians who are not claiming this credit. So they're leaving over $1 billion on the table. And that could go right back into exactly. our economy. Exactly. It could really be an economic stimulus. So many of us are now taking care of our elderly parents. Yes, yes. And I did not know that there is uh, some tax benefits um, if you take care of an elderly uh, individual. Yes, yes. So if uh, there is a credit for the elderly and or for the disabled, and uh, it requires that you be obviously a United States citizen, but you sure. can qualify for the credit if at the end of the tax year, 2013, sure. um, you were um, 65 years or older, right. or you retired on permanent disability. But again, this is a credit that uh, really helps those who um, likely are um, you know, not, not in a good so financial it, situation. It's as a, a credit of, for the For elder, the actual elderly Not for the person. caregiver, per right, se. Right, exactly. What about, though, there is a credit for child and dependent care. There is. There is. And that is also a similar type of situation? Yes. Uh -huh. These are for taxpayers who pay um, someone to care for their children oh. under the age of uh, 13. And uh, these are uh, taxpayers. Uh, they have to have earned income from wages or self-employment. But uh, the federal credit can be uh, up to 35% of it's the paid real. expenses. Yeah. Her name it's is Betty real. Yee. She is a member of the Board of Equalization, candidate for controller of the great state of California. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's California Edition. Perfect.
It's California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We are coming to you from the state capitol in Sacramento, California. We are joined by Ben Weiso. He is a member of the California State Senate, representing significant portions of San Diego County and Imperial County. And I want to speak with you, sir, about energy and our energy needs. A lot of discussion about different sources of energy, be it oil, how we extract oil, where we get oil, wind, solar, whatever it may be. You're looking at geothermal energy. What exactly is geothermal energy? Geothermal is uh, pretty much heated water, water that's need, uh, heated naturally by the Earth's core that's located uh, very far below the Earth's surface within uh, a, a contained area. California has two areas of significant geothermal activity. One of them is in my, in my district, in the Imperial County, which is uh, understood to be the largest source of geothermal in the United States. You're kidding. Where is the other one? Do you know? The other one is in Northern California, uh, right around Napa, Sonoma counties. So here we are, Imperial County, which has yeah. suffered tremendously during the economic downturn. Yes. I'm sure could use an economic boost like none other. And you mm -hmm. are looking to provide at least a partial boost through geothermal energy development. Tell us about that. Well, you know, California, I consider the leader in uh, sustainable energy. And I have a select committee dealing with California's uh, energy, achieving California's energy independence. This is a source for us to, to generate our own <coughs> electricity entirely within, within our own state. If you consider something like San Onofre, which is a nuclear power plant located in the coastline, it produces 20% of all of Southern California's electrical needs. This is one power plant providing that amount of energy. We know the challenges with nuclear, and that it has a waste, right. and that also has an impact on the marine environment. And we know also, if I may, sir, San Onofre is offline right now, and will be offline forever, as I understand it. Yeah, that may be the case. Right. Uh, I believe that by the time those uh, you know, legal challenges are settled, it's going to be way beyond the, the, the time we'll even need that plant. So one could argue your timing couldn't be better. <laughs> we I wish, need to replace the San Onofre energy. I wish we had started pushing for this sooner so that it could perfectly replace San Onofre, but there is enough geothermal activity in Imperial County to completely replace San Onofre, 100%. Remarkable. Where do we go from here, though? Because obviously this is a very significant project. Geothermal has a, very nearly all the qualities of, of nuclear and that has a long transmission rate and has a very strong power. And the, the good news about geothermal is it runs 24 hours. Unlike solar that only runs during sure. the day, geothermal runs around the clock, 24 hours a day. And it's completely renewable. It has zero emissions, so it doesn't impact air quality. It doesn't have a waste like nuclear waste that has to be stored somewhere that takes thousands of years to decompose, and it doesn't impact the marine biology. So we're not impacting uh, air quality or anything else, <coughs> and we're producing the sustainable, clean energy that can power our needs well into the future. Because, you know, oftentimes we have to uh, provide uh, a, uh, a subsidy on the environment. And what I mean by that is will you allow uh, a lot of these plants to either contaminate the air, contaminate the ocean without a mitigation or a cost that ratepayers don't have to bear. And I want to talk more about that when we come back. Fascinating discussion. Okay. For our viewers on HLN, we thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So with geothermal, sir, you're saying it's clean, it's green, where do we go next? Because as you said, in Imperial County, there is a huge reservoir of this heated water. Mm -hmm. How do we access it? Is it a public-private partnership? It's, it's incentivizing it. It's asking the PUC to put more weight on uh, pursuing power from that area. Uh, there, it, it isn't the cheapest power source because it involves drilling. It involves, uh, you know, um, cleaning pipes that often get uh, 
clogged with, uh, you know, the, the, the geothermal activity. It's not, it's not clean water. It's water that's mixed sure. in with other minerals. So that every day they're extracting minerals. But s these minerals are also an opportunity because uh, we also consider that one of the largest sources of lithium in the United States. So as we're, we're creating power, we're extracting lithium that can be used for batteries. No doubt. So we, if you can imagine us producing enough electricity there cleanly to power electric vehicles and also provide them with the battery to store that energy. Uh, you know, it's, it's the future of California because California leads. You know, we have to st support uh, you know, government policies that, sure. will, that will help us generate these clean, renewable energies. At this stage, though, you say it's not the cheapest. It could be a little expensive to generate. But if we march down that path, do economies of scale start to take hold and therefore it becomes less expensive, like we see with solar, for example, or the hybrids that we are driving? So, yes, mm -hmm. and, and remember that we're not subsidizing an industry that pollutes the environment either. So when you have to go back and account for air quality, how much is it costing us right now to clean air quality in, in, in the country? We don't apply that to our electrical rates. If we did, it would make natural gas and other sources of power much more expensive. So we're finding other revenues to buy to, to clean air quality. We, don't, we won't have that problem with geothermal. That's why we have to give it special consideration that it's currently not given in California. So is it the PUC that needs to act or... Could it be the legislature that needs to provide incentives? Or can the administration through executive order? Or do you speak with your friends in Washington, D.C. to get a federal incentive? Where do we go? All of the above. All of the above. And I'm leading with a bill that would uh, create kind of the, the, the direction for the PUC to follow that would allow them to give extra consideration to geothermal when approving new facilities for, for power generation throughout our state. So if you can imagine that we've incentivized solar production, yes. that's why companies have moved to California to produce solar, because we're giving them uh, special consideration. Th that's what I'm seeking to do for, for geothermal. So how close are we? It seems very exciting. I can only imagine for you as the senator from the Imperial County region, which <laughs> unemployment rate is astronomical, that this would be a godsend. We, we are there. We are there today. We have geothermal plants that are currently in operation. Today? Ge today. Oh, they're, wow. they're operating in Imperial County and they're operating successfully and they're already extracting lithium, but they're not operating at the level that they should. Because? There is more potential. I estimate that we can, I mean, if, if, they, were, if they were operating at 20%, we have 80% more than we can wow. do. So. There is enormous potential in increasing our productivity in this area. And I think if we move to sustainable power, I think Californians would support that. I think they, they want to drive, or at least the, the, the Californians that want to drive electric vehicles, they want to do that because not only sure. do they want to save on gas, but they, they, want, to, they want to use a, a cleaner fuel that doesn't contaminate air. When you think about fracking, you think about drilling into the yes. ground, and there's a lot of controversy surrounding mm -hmm. drilling into the ground uh, because alleged earthquakes or groundwater contamination, whatever it may be. Does this have the same risk? No. Um, imagine a water tank that you will penetrate on one end to extract the steam. I see. And another connection that connects an inlet to re-inject. So it's kind of a loop that's being powered in a, a cyclical for, uh, motion where you, the same current of, of, of uh, steam is powering the, the energy production. And it's the steam that's causing the current. It's the steam. Right. It's the, the heat from the steam that's powering generators that are creating electricity. And it's, it's a closed loop. As long as you're re-injecting water, the Earth's core is re always reheating it and you never lose anything from the system. If anything, you're removing solids, which we're hopefully going to use for industrial and job creation in the state of California. He's been way so on Brad Palmer. It's, it's California edition. Fascinating.
It's California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. We are coming to you from Sacramento, the state's capital, and we are joined by Chris Holden, member of the California State Assembly. He is the majority whip. He is also a proud graduate of San Diego State University. The Aztecs have had a great basketball season this year. You play basketball. Yeah, 74 to 78. A proud wow. Aztec, and I'm very proud of the, the team. They're showing us very proud throughout I can the, only imagine. this tournament. Yeah, yeah I want to speak about something else, if I may. A bit provocative, but important. Yes. Uh, it deals with massage therapy. Yes. Massage parlors. Right. Look, the reality is there are legitimate massage parlors around yeah. and there are some that aren't so legitimate. That's correct. Take us back to 2008-2009 yeah. and what happened with the state law and what we're doing now. Well, um, prior to 2008, the cities pretty much had the ability to regulate and control um, these type of operations and because they were so uh, closely aligned to um, uh, prostitution right. and human trafficking type activities that they found themselves in the outskirts and industrial communities and you know uh, having to pay exorbitant fees and things of that nature and the problem is that the legitimate operators were caught up in that so they put forth uh, an agenda that said look we need to have state regulation so that we're not sort of held hostage under the concerns legitimate concerns that sure. cities might have and so um, the passage of SB 731 in 2008 um, uh, created the uh, council, Massage Therapy Council, which essentially would then govern uh, the operations of massa massage therapy operations. And, and it did centralize laws surrounding massage therapists, is that fair? It, 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 it did indeed. But it also basically then stripped cities of all of their authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was no more home rule in terms of the ability to uh, to deal with the bad actors, if you will, and to uh, have some way of then imposing appropriate fines and then apparently getting them to a place right. where they can um, clear them out of the city if they needed to. So under the 2008-2009 law, there is a sunset provision. Yes. And it's coming up now, so this is a prime opportunity to revisit the law and look for fixes, which is standard. That's right. The the It is being presented to the um, Business and Professions uh, and Consumer Protection Committee, which I am a member. Right. And so we're looking at it right now. We've had a, uh, a hearing that allowed for both sides to, to basically make their concerns known. Obviously cities, small cities particularly, those that ha or have been overrun by these type of operators. Could you tell us about the city of Stanton, a small city near Anaheim, California in Orange County? 3.1 miles um, in, in size, uh, 20 eight uh, uh, operators of uh, massage therapy operators in that small area um, but also 27 of the 28 are actually on the website on as it's been shared with us on illicit websites uh, uh, offering services that that are, are rather shady so that it is and these are operations that close at midnight to one two o'clock in the morning so that it clear by definition is not uh, a legitimate operation so the cities are feeling that their hands are tied because they don't have the ability to shut down operators like that and this change in the law at least during this time where we're looking at the sunset provision uh, gives us the opportunity to take another look at this and say um, did we did the state legislature go too far right and putting all of the authority uh, in this commission massage therapy commission and thereby live, leaving cities with the inability to regulate and in some cases use their public safety powers to shut down the really bad performers. So as we speak today, you're looking to simply modify the law, not necessarily devolve all power back to localities, but create a nice balance between the two. I think that's, that's where we're looking for, that, that place where, because obviously the cities are saying, sunset and right. let all the power revert back but then when you it's have balance. it's it's going to be a balance when we come back i want to continue our conversation speak about community colleges and high schools partnering for our viewers on hln i want to thank you for joining us for our other viewers we'll be right back on california edition so i want to continue our conversation speak about high school seniors okay i remember when i was in high school there were a few kids that took classes at the local community college. Mm -hmm. But it seemed uh, pretty willy-nilly, loosey-goosey. You're looking to change that formula. Right, we have a bill, a 1451, which essentially is a dual or concurrent enrollment uh, bill. And it will create legislation that will allow in a more comprehensive way throughout the state where um, unified school districts and community colleges will develop agreements where concurrent enrollment would be spelled out very clearly, the roles and responsibilities, 
uh, teachers, where they would um, uh, provide the service, whether right. it would be on the high school campus or the community college campus. But the whole goal really is to give high school seniors an opportunity to start their college experience early. And what's interesting, you mentioned this to me, I didn't think about it, it's not necessarily just for the accelerated student. Right. Talk no. to me about that. Well, you know, we, we see right now, and it's never made sense to me, how we graduate seniors who go to community colleges and then they need remedial training once they get there. Right. Um, so this bill will allow for seniors who are graduating to have the opportunity to really refine their skills and to be able to be prepared that once they graduate they can go to a community college and begin taking community college courses that leads towards their graduation. Right. So or it's matriculation. Not like, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we've seen in recent times, not just because of the budget and the impact on um, the ability to have classes offered on a regular basis where community college students were stuck for well beyond, you know, three, four, five years, Especially sometimes longer. Term. This gives them an opportunity to hit the ground running and to be able to have uh, credits already built up so when they get there, they're moving close to graduation. So in your district is Pasadena Community College, one yes. of the best community colleges in our state, mm -hmm. if I may say. Yes. Have you spoken with, is it President Rocha, Mark Rocha? Yes, it I mean, is. Mark and Rocha. other presidents? I mean, what do they think about this proposal? Well, the, the community colleges love the idea. They think it, it creates a wonderful opportunity uh, and they like the fact that they can have a more organized and, and structured relationship with the unified school districts, right. the K through 12, and certainly high school in this particular, uh, in this essence. And, and so to be able to start offering classes that will allow for not only those who would like to continue their education beyond and make their way to higher ed, but also those who may need vocational training and, and are looking for a vocational training route. So if growing up, as you'll recall, in high school, we had uh, vocational ed, uh, whether it was auto shop, auto shop or, or home economics or, mm -hmm. or whatever it might have been. Um, and I think those are important to bring back. This creates an opportunity to start bringing some focus back to vocational education as well. And I think the community colleges see that as a really important uh, part of what they were originally established to do. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this issue, and if you're not, forgive me, but I wanted to throw something at you if I may. Sure. You may have heard that there is a move afoot to consider whether community colleges should be permitted to offer four-year degrees. Hmm. Senator Marty Block has proposed this. Mm -hmm. He proposed it a few years ago. He's brought it back. Several states have looked into this issue. Are you familiar with this topic at all? No, but I, I know that, well, I, I'm vaguely familiar okay. with it. Uh, I mean, because I, I, I do know, I've heard, and you may have heard uh, over the years, that mm -hmm. because of the way that Pasadena City College has grown and some right. other community colleges, they almost, from a physical standpoint, right. look like a, 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 a university. So there, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm not sure of the mechanics and how it all comes together, right. but uh, certainly increasing capacity for our young people to go to colleges uh, will make it easier for them not only to get accepted but to be able to fulfill right. their opportunity. And at the same time, we look at funding for community colleges uh, and UCs and CSUs, mm -hmm. and we see that funding is coming back a bit. Yes. Not as much though as K-12. K-12 funding is roaring back. Now yes. that may be a great uh, a chain of events. Yes. Do you think though we need to start paying a little more attention to community college funding, CSU, UC, in terms of bringing those funding levels back to pre-recession levels? Well we do, we do. I mean I think that if we can focus on um, setting certainly a plan for the future, education has got to be the centerpiece of that. Uh, certainly as we talk about job creation and opportunities for an educated, trained workforce, it really starts with early education, quite frankly. So making sure that young people have pre-K and that they have mm -hmm. access, because obviously the studies show that the earlier young people start into their educational um, process, the, the better their chances of going to college on the back end. Well, I know your leadership is looking at a pre-K program, TK program. We don't know if the governor is bullish on it. It wasn't in his budget. When you come back, will you discuss that issue? I will. His name is Chris Holden. He is a member of the California City Assembly. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and this is California Edition.